Hello everyone, today we talk about the juridical school of the commentators. So, uh, this goes a bit in, in parallel with the school of Orléans that we have not uh, treated yet, so I will make some reference to certain scholars like, I don't know, Pierre de Belperche and so on. This would be the Italian um, parallel to it, and not the opposite as historiographically speaking this is uh, being stated. Um, the School of Orléans was a very important center of learning, especially for Roman law um, in the uh, Pays uh, de droit coutumier. Um, differently from Paris, where you know the Roman law was not taught, this was very important for the French kings to boost, you know, in their centralizing policies. So there was a certain historiography that basically said um, uh, that looked at the the what was happening in Italy and saying, okay, well, there was no originality in it um, because, you know, in France there were similar things happening before. Um, and um, today instead we believe things actually went differently, uh, if not oppositely in a sense, um, except for, you know, the chronological point of view. And we'll explain why. Uh, also because in here there is the passage from the glossarists to the commentators, and there, therefore, the uh, a new phase, literally, in the evolution of juridical uh, medieval juridical thought proper, right? Um, opening from the beginning of the 14th century. So we'll cover all those other mm, aspects um, in in dedicated videos. Today we s mm, we stick to it, and we observe, um, especially these three major uh, sc scholars, uh, jurists. Um, Cino Sigibuldi from Pistoia, um, Bartolo from Sassoferrato, and Baldo de Ubaldi, that are fundamentally the three pillars of of this mm, of this juridical uh, current, we could say. Um, so starting with Cino, um, Cino Sigibuldi from Pistoia, uh, living between 1270 and 1336. So here we are basically at the peak of communal civilization, and it's not a surprise in this regard, just even as an indicator that such juridical system was actually very advanced. Um, Savigny, um, um, I'll bite uh, expressing some uh, critics on the work of this jurist, of whom he pointed out the, um, the actual great and sometimes even, you know, overwhelming use of the dialectical metal, method, um, stated that um, had already recognized that uh, he was fundamentally uh, independent from the teaching of the school of Orléans, right? And a full autonomy from the French masters was also reiterated by the following um, scholars. Um, and um, against this opinion uh, expressed, um, expressed himself Meyers, uh, who um, in the school in the work of the school of Orléans stated that Chino, albeit not having studied at Orléans, uh, as some historians believed, had previously believed, had to have, you know, at hand the works of uh, Pierre de Belperche and other Orléanist, let's call it Orléanian uh, jurists, um, so mm, much to slavishly reproduce their thinking um, in, in, in his, his own work. So for Meyers it was the Orleanian school to uh, innovate in a meaningful way the methodological setting of the medieval juridical science while Chino from Pisoia would have not uh, brought to uh, you know mm, say a contribution of meaningful originality. Uh, and Mayer's thesis mm, was actually long neglected um, for, especially in Italy, as you can imagine from, from a national point of view, but it was eventually resumed by same Italian scholars that didn't find them convincing at all for mm, different reasons. First of all, the difficulty to define in an exact manner the contribution of the Orlanian masters um, those works um, had, mm, you know, never, probably never been studied in, in their own uh, ensemble, let's say, altogether, systematically. Second, 
the difficulty to establish precisely the contribution of, of, of every single jurist of that school um, given both, let's say, the, the scholastic form of the exegetical comment because the Orleanian school was particularly, you know, much into philosophy. Of course, it it somewhat resembles also the, uh, the Parisian method, so something different from what actually uh, the Italians were doing. Um, and characterized also by a gradual process of interpretative and constructive enrichment that had formed in almost an alluvial way through this exegetical um, and collective effort of schools and generations of scholars, uh, and also of the intervention of, in, uh, of comments and of, of notes introduced in the text by those who used them, uh, who used the, the same work, um, in that mm, would eventually, mm, as we know, also become in integrant, um, say, um, integral part of the same text or even fusing with, with it. Uh, and third, the dialectical method that Meyers indicated as an innovative um, characteristic of the Orleanian exegesis was the fact that the, um, say, um, gnosiological and expositional instrument common to all medieval science, right, that was already known, uh, for example, to the first Bolognese glossarists, right, since the beginning, thus. Um, and on the basis of such considerations, um, it, you know, uh, certain Italian scholars believed that th there, is, there was not actually a, a re even a real contraposition between the Orleanian masters and the Bolognese glossarists. And that even more incorrect it would have been to attribute to the first the beginning of a new epoch of the history of ju juridical thought, given that um, a, a contribution of, of you know, the same level of originality and of, uh, say, cultural relevance had already had been known among the Italian jurists of the second half of the 13th century. Um, and such uh, ideas initially, so, devaluated the originality of the School of Orléans. From the other, they were highlighting uh, that the method promoted by Chino found its most its deepest roots, in, in fundamentally in a spontaneous evolution of the juridical culture of, of the, during the second half of the 13th century, uh, a process that started, stemmed from, from the gloss, and that was lived in Italy as in France. Um, so the contribution of Chino from Pistoia and, and such evolution was certainly of great meaning because it paralleled in, in the Orleanian one. Um, and the most important of Chino's works was the Lectura Super Codice. It was composed between 1312 and 1314. It knew uh, an extraordinary spread, not just in Italy, but also in France uh, it itself, in Spain, in Germany. And uh, it had such a great success, uh, a clamorous one even, uh, in this regard, considering also that you know uh, what what this means at the time. I mean, by the second half of the 13th century, of course, there was an ever more intertwined European dimension. But the fact that this was spread so far, even to Germany and Spain, were you know uh, significantly different. I mean, Italy and France were much more connected, right? Uh, and, and especially from the you know in this higher intellectual levels, um, so reveals uh, at that point all basically in all the West a, a, an important. Um, you know, functionality, even to those, you know, jurists of those, those respective national realities that were at a different de state, you know, levels of um, development of organization, so on. Uh, furthermore, Chino composed a Lectura Super Digesto Veteri that, uh, that survives all, uh, only in part, and a second one, the Lectura on the Vetus, that uh, is also fragmentary, and it's particularly interesting because it testifies in a clear manner uh, um, a neat independence of Chino from the thought of Pierre de Belperche. Um, uh, and he wrote also the Questiones Concilia Ditiones and maybe both the Repeticiones, that were, you know, because they were found all together, it might have been in different orders, and the brief treaty 
de successione ab intestato. And in the lectura super codice, Cino exposes uh, um, his um, methodological program, right? That uh, whatever the depth, let's say, towards the uh, Orleanians and the, post and the Italian post glossarists marks definitely the beginning of a new epoch in medieval juridical science. And the same jurist declared, this is, was his method, uh, circa cuius lecturam tenebo unc ordinem, quia primo dividam secundum ponam casum, tercio colligam, quarto ponam, quinto queram. So according to this program, thus, the reading of the Justinian and passage had to pass through various moments, the divisio legis, so the separation of, of the text in, in the various parts in which it was logically composed, eventually the expositio, so the explanation of the passage uh, in his ball, and eventually um, thus the, the positio casum proper, that is the indication of, of, of some of the many situations in which the parts of the juridical relation could Found, find themselves in, and again, uh, um, uh, again, the collectio notabilium, that is the individuation of the principal aspects of this passage, the oppositionis, the comparison with event, you know, with you know some other, um, say, um, parallel and opposed passages could be found. Um, and um, finally, the questionis, that is the indication of the most relevant interpretative problems. And the objective of such procedure was the individuation of the uh, substantial meaning of the norm, that is the ratio legis. Right? And all this dialectical work that basically fragmented the legislative text um, uh, you know, presented basically a fragment, uh, analyze it in itself, and then eventually it recompose it in the wall, um, in order to assume basically the the let's say the deepest sense of it. This is very important because it contextualizes properly the ratio legis of the passage uh, in the wall work, um, and it, naturally scholars have underlined the originality of the method theorized and followed by Chino that doesn't reside much in the single operations that he listed, given that the glossarists already uh, knew them, but um, ra uh, rather in the systematicity in the approach to the text and in the relation between different phases of the exegetical um, procedure. Um, while, in fact, to the first five was reserved a reduced space, the sixth mm, um, was widely deepened with a rich, um, say, a great wealth of theoretical questions of cases drawn from, from practice, from and praxis proper of, uh, let's say, foot for thought and discussion assumed from the legislation of city statutes and proposed um, from the teacher to the, the students. And the cultural ferments that had characterized um, the mm, juridical culture in the second half of the 13th century in Italy as in France reached thus with Chino a full uh, maturity and uh, original systematicity. Chino taught in Siena, in Perugia, and for a while, uh, for a short while, also in Naples. And with him would have started the current of the Italian juridical science that marked by the use of the dialectical method theorized and followed by the same Chino and by the research of the ratio legis is named as the school of commentarists uh, because the commentum or commentarium, not the gloss anymore, uh, was the literary form that characterized it. We have looked at the glossarists. Basically, the work was the gloss, the, the, the systematization of this um, corpus of notes that uh, revolved around the text. Here, instead, you have literally a broader comment to the work. There's something different. It's more theoretical, it's more uh, systematic. In fact, if the aim of the gloss had been the clarification of the littera, literally, so the 
literally un understanding the text and the, the meaning of it. Um, the one of the comment was the, let's say, the, the, the penetration of the senses, of the meaning, of the, the actual, you know, significance in the work through the use of the tri triumphing at this point dialectical method that in this point was you know um, was uh, booming in the uh, schools of philosophy and theology and that's why also the uh, the French were pioneering it and famously enough at least if you are um, acquainted with medieval law uh, the most influential figure of this school was Bartolo from Sasso Ferrato leaving between 1313-14 and 1357. Wu, um, say, f f attended, when he was very, very young in Perugia, some lessons of Chino. And these um, classes that, as he would admit himself um, in his maturity, influenced in a determinant and definitive manner his methodological um, system. With Bartolo, the uh, dialectical method was consolidated, was imposed in the schools, it became the dominant address. Uh, his work uh, was enormous, right? It, here we're talking about people that even just if you know how medieval jurists actually learn, what they had to learn and how we will explain it in part. And here, I, I mean, learning by heart here it was like, think everything you have learned by art uh, in your life. and multiply 1,000 more at least, <laughs> right? Just because of the volume of what the, they study. Um, and, um, it, it, and these people had to not only learn that by heart, but being able, therefore, to basically know all, all of these parts and to create something new on a comet in a bro. It, it, it's something incredible. I mean, the, 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 the intellectual effort of medieval man is, is an unparalleled, historically speaking, in terms of individually speaking. Um, and we we're speaking uh, es essentially about the uh, I mean first of all of course the interpretation of the libri legales of the of, um, that was expressed uh, both in his um, commentaria to each of the single books uh, and the commentarium is distinguished from the lectura because it was constituted um, of a uh, definite text that circulated in the you know extension wanted by the author by the writing wanted by the author for which we find it um, in many manuscripts always in the same form while the lectura has a variable documentation because even a single course of lessons might have found different formal texts also in the glossae contrarium which we uh, basically, let's say, were listed the ordinary glosses were contrary to one another. And in the numerous repeticiones and the also numerous questiones and distinciones. Also, Bartolo composed various uh, tractatus. The collection published in Venice in 1472 reunited 28 of them. Uh, the following one published still in, in Venice in 1521, added other eight, and a further two were inserted in the following collections, and um, on themes uh, concerning uh, problems of great relevance in the organization of social, and um, uh, let's say, uh, and in concrete life, you know, in, uh, of the law, um, in which next to the Roman law were taken into consideration the jura propria that we will discuss maybe some other time um, but especially the statutory law right so uh, the the cities uh, city states um, uh, statutes um, also the concilia that were expression of the intense um, uh, con say uh, advising activity that carried out uh, by the jurist and and his interest for the praxis and the complex and articulated uh, juridical and effective reality so these men were by the way of course always at the side of the governments were expressing very high 
also political institutional concepts that resonated um, in the you know think about the relations with the Roman Empire you know I mean you know the, there was a big deal here of questions as you will see will basically unite both in canon law with the secular one in a sense um, Bartolo um, basically um, implemented China's innovation touching let's say the highest peaks through the refining of the co uh, commentic technique with his dialectical force and with his exceptional capacity to dig into the depth of the literal edges to extract the, the most reposed mens et ratio so the virtually the mindset that stands behind the, the juridical norms and properly their logic uh, and through the use of an innovative charge, let's say, contained in the new hermeneutic technique, because uh, in the, let's say, mm, gaps mm, provoked by the apparent fragmentation of this such litera, in, at least in its uh, structural elements, began to penetrate those germs of life that was uh, of the new societas juris, that was basically uh, grafted on the old trunk of the Lex Scripta. And this is a characteristic that will remain um, in the Italian juridical tradition uh, for centuries as basically it was founded on, on, on practice. We have seen this on the uh, video we made on the Littera Moderna, the, Flor the Florentine Humanism, and eventually was adopted in France, right? It was criticism towards the Bolognese studies, but one of the main characteristics of these works is that they basically um, managed to create around the old body of Roman law, actually a lot of other law that was not there just for the sake of being philologically correct, given the, the historical text, etc., but to be pract of practical views. Um, this is a very, very, very important characteristic, and definitely, especially with Bartolo, this reached the, the apex and so much that, you know, he had a, a huge fame in the Middle Ages, um, which uh, rose um, further even uh, after his death. His thought became the sap and blood of the Italian juridical doctrine, uh, dominating basically an unchallenged in the uh, uh, tribunal courts um, so much to give origin to the aphorism nullus bonus jurista, nisi sit bartolista, which means, of course, there can't be any good jurist if it's, if it's not from from Bartolo school fundamentally um, and um, this this address would be I mean his address would become in the 16th century still object of a specific university chair in 1544 in pa um, in Padua one of the most the most important universities in Europe before humanistic tradition and so on uh, um, uh, uh, a chair was assigned to the literary, uh, literally lectura textus glosse et Bartoli. That is to say, you know, or the reading of the of the Justinian Code, the glosse, so the, the glossarists proper, and Bartolus. That is to say, there was not even a way to say, you know, the comment, the co no, because he was the guy who had done the freaking thing, so he dominated um, with his work. And the Paduan example was eventually followed by Turin, um, Bologna, and in the following century, so we're talking about the 17th still, Perugia, Macerata, and Naples. And the fame that um, had also the you know, the, the consequence to attribute naturally to, to Bartolo works of other jurists um, in order to emphasize the scientific authoritativeness of the same as it often happens. So that was a, a giant, a milestone in medieval juridical and for a even modern juridical culture. Uh, Bartolo taught specifically in Siena and in Perugia, that I have seen also for Cina, and in the latter, he had, as his pupil, another giant of the school of the uh, commentarists that um, uh, was Baldo de Diopaldi. This is another great name. He lived between 1327 and died around 1400. 
um, who, and he carried out uh, an intense scientific and didactic activity he taught in Bologna, Pisa, Florence, Padua, Pavia and especially in Perugia and with Baldo there is the um, complete dissolution of the traditional distinction between civilists and canonists that had been defined since the time of the gloss so much that he um, basically turned his interpretation to both to civil and canonic law. You know that this was an important difference because basically the church had its own law and the uh, you know the, the the secular world his own um, and further let's say now we, we can't digress on the glossaries specifically but let's say they pioneered secular law even though you know they weren't basically anybody like in terms of authority they still you know function because of course and you know that's the, the decline of the empire and all the issue there but um, since the beginning, and especially this, most of this stuff was going on in Italy um, because of the Italian communes that saw the booming of this juridical science and the church in Rome um, or wherever it was, you know, at this time had changed seat, but you know, of course, it was still tied to Rome and it's in central Italian possessions. Uh, it, it, you know, the, the evolution of, of such. Uh, theories was so great and so encompassing in, I'd say, omnicomprehensive uh, at the level of practical power because the church also naturally had uh, a de facto a, a temporal power that um, you know they couldn't help but intertwine at a certain point. That is to say, because of course jurisdictions intertwined at the time in everyday life, but also because um, they even conceptually, they, they fed much from one another, and also they were opposed in a sense. I mean, the emperors usually took the, the Bolognese school to kind of stress through Roman law the prerogative secular power of the church. The church did the opposite. So, of course, by clashing, they, they, they came to hybridize, you know, more simply, you know, just by curiosity, by learning, because it was not a permanent struggle. But still, it was inherent in those societies broadly meant, and this brought to, to, to a great... So, here we're talking really about uh, an intellectual development that wasn't happening anywhere. I mean, if you realize, this is, this is the 14th century, is the century of, of humanism. Uh, the 15th, the, one, the Renaissance basically began. So, uh, it's, it's something that, of course, reflects this broader, let's say, moral and material wealth of these communities and their capacity to especially have a, a multi, let's say uh, a capacity to define an order that previously didn't exist right this is very different for example from the French tradition that at the end of the day still was uh, guided by by the monarchy in some measure at least it was comforted by it it had that specific you know um, it, you know it, that specific protection, let's say, but um, the, the here we're talking really uh, about an enormous effort. So when we look at Bar uh, at uh, Baldo's work, right, we look at the Commentario first of all of all the libri legal all, all the libri legales, uh, the composition of a lectura to the liber extra, and also an, a, a very rich production of concilia. So all these advice was given politically and of a great relevance was his comment to the peace of Constance um, and uh, his lectura of the Libri Feodorum as well. So here you understand that here we're talking about the highest poli political events and jurisdictions that, that, that ex were existing at the time. So we're really giants. Um, because ev because politics literally depended on what these people wrote because this law could be weaponized against uh, and, and the the importance here I don't, I don't know whether on Schwerpunkt we will get in actual detail to these things maybe a bit in the history of uh, his, history of thought or other stuff but like um, the the impact of these these ideas in the world at the time is, is dramatically um, un, uh, overlooked um, so the school of the comment calling like this constitutes constitutes thus the great uh, Italian doctrine of the late Middle Ages. So next to the masters that we were talking about before, we have to remember, among the others, for the 14th century, Jacopo Bottrigari, 
it was um, um, actually Bartolo's master at uh, Bologna, Jacopo da Belviso, uh, whose comments had to do both, even in here, the civil um, um, law. Um, the, for example, the comments to the authentic comment to, li to the Libri Feudorum, and the canonical one, the treaty, for example, known as the Excommunicazione, also a pretty meaningful title if you think about it, Oldrado da Ponte, Alberico da uh, Rosate, Ranieri Arsendi from Forlì, Francesco Tigrini, um, Bar uh, Bartolomeo from Saliceto and the Southerner Luca uh, from Penne that we saw recently when we talk about even the Neapolitan studium juridical tradition. Um, for the 15th century we have Paolo of Castro, Raffaele Fulgosio, uh, Alessandro Tartagna, Giason del Maino, Giovanni from Imola, Angelo Gambiglione from Arezzo, Francesco Accolti, known as the Aretine, Aretine uh, Bartolomeo Cipolla, Bartolomeo Socini, and Filippo Decio. And the overcoming of the division between scholars of civil and of canonic law had a double consequence. From one side, also the latter shared the new dialectical method. So we're talking about that aforementioned osmosis. Um, on the other hand, many of them also began to deal of civil law. And uh, among those that privileged the study of canon texts, we have to remember, first of all, Giov Giovanni d'Andrea, living between 1270, uh, around 1270 and 1348, um, author of the Novella in Decretales Gregori Noni, that is, you know, the, the novella w were called um, the the mother and the the daughter of the jurist uh, who wanted to use their name for some of their you know uh, works um, of the gloss both to Sextus and the Clementine um, so these were decretals for example um, and of a summa desponsalibus et matrimonio uh, an ordo judiciarius uh, um, of arbores consanguinitatis, of additiones to the speculum judiciale, of um, Guillaume Durand, um, and numerous other treatises. Uh, between the 13th and the 14th century flourished also uh, Francesco Zabarella, 1335-1417, author uh, of a rich comment to the Liber Extra and of a lectura super Clementinis, and also of uh, Questiones, Repetitiones, and Tractatus, then Pietro d'Ancarano and Antonio da Putrio. Um, in the, the 15th century, eventually, the most prominent uh, figure among the canonists was the one of Niccolò Tedeschi, known as Abbas Modernus, in order to distinguish him from the Abbas Antiquus, the title that with whom was known. Um, Bernard de, de Montmirat de, was uh, a jurist of the uh, second half of the 13th century, or Panormitanus, because he had received a bishopric in, in Palermo. And he was the author of a lecture to the Liber Extra, to the Sexus and to the Clementine, but also of the Questiones, Disputationes, Allegationes, and of the Flores Utrusque Juris. And next to him we remember Giovanni Danagni, uh, Andrea Barbazza, Felino Sandeo, and Mariano Socci. Well, all right, so for today we stop here. Naturally, we'll be talking about the School of Orléans at some point. Um, and also further developments of this um, juridical address. Uh, but um, for now we stop it here. Just hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please share it. Otherwise, leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content. And for now, uh, I thank you heartily for uh, listening to me. I wish you a nice time and see you next time. Bye.